let's take another look at our friend, the liquid line filter dryer. Again, it goes on the liquid line, anywhere on the liquid line. Ideally though, the liquid line filter dryer should be installed close to the metering device inside the house when possible. Now that's best practices. That doesn't mean that's the only place to put it. In a place like Florida, it will be very important. Imagine this being outside. This is just metal and you have a lot of seawater, a lot of salt water. It causes these to rust a lot faster and have a leak. Now in Nevada, for example, you end up with the indoor unit being in an attic two-story house, attic, surrounded by wood, you want to do as least amount of brazing as possible. One, because of the wood, but number two, because it's hot. It's extremely hot in the attic in Nevada. It's 115 degrees outside, 150, 160, 170 degrees in the attic. You want to do is spend as least amount of time in the attic as possible. So in Nevada, you'll see a lot of times people will put these outside. I'm not real big on it. I like to put it inside when possible. When it's not possible, I'm not really throwing a big fit about it. But somewhere on the liquid line, there should be a liquid line filter dryer. Now let's take a look again at how that liquid line filter dryer works. We talked about this before, but it doesn't hurt to refresh. It's important to understand the direction of the refrigerant flow. So our arrows are flowing in this direction. So if we see that our filter is built with this little groove cut in the center, and we have our filter material here. So the idea is we go through this desiccate and then through the filter material. So if you know this desiccate comes loose and you can see if we shake this, there's little bits of that desiccate floating around in there. This filter catches it before it goes through the system. If we put it in the other way, we're going through this filter material first and the desiccate could push into the system. So we don't want that to happen. It's fairly rare for that to happen, but I have seen it happen before where this desiccate comes loose and ends up trashing the system or clogging up the filter dryer. So let's look at how this is designed to work. This our refrigerant comes in and it hits this plate and this plate is designed to divert the refrigerant around the very outside. If you can see this filter dryer comes over here and it has this little bit of an angle on it that angles to allow the refrigerant to flow around it. So the refrigerant comes all the way outside. It has to go through this desiccate material. So this going through this desiccate material, it is being dried. In other words, it's pulling out H2O. Now when I say dry, don't get H2O and any liquid mixed up. A lot of students do that. As liquid refrigerants flowing through here, it's not stopping at all. It's only pulling out the H2O. Think about this like those little packages you get when you order a product. The little packages absorb moisture. They allow it to keep that product nice and dry. The same product, same thing is happening here. So this is filtering it from the outside. Then it collects together on the inside of this tube goes through the filter material and onto our liquid line. So if you see on surface area alone, there's a lot of surface area around this whole entire perimeter of this filter dryer. So it can collect a lot of contaminants on the outside. And as the refrigerant gets closer and closer to the center, it's purer and cleaner and we collect together in this little cutout section and go forward. So that's an important concept. If we have a refrigerant flowing the other direction, we end up with the opposite effect we end up with that refrigerant coming in and all of that refrigerant trying to be filtered through this very small amount of surface area. Then it goes through this filter material or the desiccate material and collects on the outside. So it would stop up a whole lot faster if we put this in backwards. Plus we have the issue of any of this desiccate material could chip away and end up floating through our system. So that's why we want it to be in the correct direction. Now you're going to see in your trade, somebody installed the filter dryer facing the wrong direction. It's going to happen and you may accidentally do it yourself. So you have to think about what are the proper fix. Well, the proper fix would make sure it's flowing the right way away from the condenser towards that metering device. Now let's look at the possibilities. Let's say we have Mrs. Jones. She's on a very fixed income. She is say in her nineties. Um, you don't know what's going on really, but you know that maybe she didn't have a whole lot of money to spend on it. This system's already been like that for say 10 or 15 years and the amount of time it would take and the amount of money it would take to pull all the refrigerant out, to cut this line out, put the new one in facing the correct direction and then pressure testing, pulling a vacuum and recharging the refrigerant, the cost would probably outweigh the benefit. Uh, so you have to look at what's really happening there. So you look at the filter dryer, we want it to be the right direction, but it's going to really be on a case by case basis of how important it is to fix it. But as long as you understand what's happening with it, it won't actually stop the flow. It potentially could cause the desiccate to come loose in the system. So it's a potential. Now remember this is a liquid line filter dryer, so it has to go in the liquid line. Just because it's a 3 8 line doesn't mean it's a liquid line. Remember leaving the compressor as a discharge line. 
If you put this liquid line filter dryer on the discharge line, the hot gas coming through this causes this to come apart and it sends out all of this desk material through the entire system and it trashes units. So to make sure it's the liquid line filter dryer goes on the true liquid line after the condensing coil, not just because it's a small line. A lot of information goes into these. We're talking about brazing and brazing these lines. If you have this line outside, you wanna make sure you protect this filter dryer when you're brazing it. The flame can end up burning the paint off of this, and when you burn the paint off, it'll end up being a spot that can rust out, especially in places like Florida. Some of these manufacturers actually put this really cool little metal ring on here, and this little metal ring does great, so when you're brazing it, it helps divert the flame. You still wanna protect this with some kind of a rag or heat absorbing paste, but it's a nice little advantage. This particular manufacturer also leaves us a nice long stem right here, so we have plenty of room to get our torch to pull the brazing rod up into this connection. Some of the manufacturers leave us a very, very small connection, like right here, it's a very small. So we have to get our flame really close to the paint to get the brazing rod to pull up into this connection. Just some of the stuff that we have to deal with, but the idea is, when possible, put it inside and protect with a rag, and worst case scenario, maybe you should add some paint to it. I worked with the guy that always repainted his filter dryers after he got done working with them. I tried to do that, but I found the paint just doesn't last long riding around in a service van. It's a great idea though, just doesn't really work well for me. Now this is what we call brazing. It's a braze connection. Some people actually do soldering. There's a huge argument. We'll get into that later. Uh, but S for soldering or S for sweating or S for brazing. We have another type of connection we use and that's called a flare fitting. So this one has a flare fitting. The flare fitting will unscrew or unthread. So if we unthread this, we see the threads and we see on the very end right here, this cone shape. Well, inside of here is also another cone shape. These two cones fit together and uh, it's very important for them to fit together and fit flush. If it doesn't, it doesn't make a very good seal and that good seal is going to leak on you. There's two things about these. It's just the copper that's been flared out. We'll get into flaring a little bit later, but that flare has to be done correct. And also this has to be the correct tightness. You'll end up with people that will over tighten these fittings. So I've seen people before that say, oh, well flare fittings notoriously leak. So they tighten them even more, trying to make sure they don't leak. Well, the problem is if you tighten this even more, that copper in there will start to split. It will start to spread out. And when the copper splits, it'll crack and it causes the leak. So the people that have an issue with these leaking, over tighten them and then over tightening them notoriously causes them to leak. There's really a torque wrench that you should use and you can torque these down to make sure you get the right specifications. I like to put a little drop of a product called Nylog right on the edge of this and it makes a really nice good seal when I put this together. They also make a new product that's a type of gasket. It's a blue gasket that fits on this between the two fittings. So when you put it together, it helps make a good seal. I've heard good and bad from that. Well, I think pretty much everything, there's a good and a bad with it, uh, but I would be something I'm willing to try. What I prefer to do is anytime I have an existing flare fitting is I like to cut off that existing flare and make a new flare that I know is gonna be good and in good shape. And then when I put my flare fittings back together, put a little bit of nylog on there and then torque these connections down. And I know I got a good solid connection. Other people prefer just simply to braze them. And if you do this connection right, it's not gonna leak. And if you do this connection right, it's not gonna leak. The key is, eh, do it right. So very important part of this filter dryer is making sure that we do that connection right. Now, just because you're gonna be seeing in residential these 3 8 liquid lines doesn't mean that's the only option. Here's a commercial filter dryer and it has, this one's half inch line. So we got half inch line coming into this, say, high quality filter dryer. It's a high volume filter dryer. Here's our aero refrigerants coming in. So it's a large pipe. And here's another filter dryer. It's even larger than that one. You can see it's a much larger pipe, but it's still a liquid line filter dryer. Some of the differences, the desiccate size. We talked about the desiccate, the size of this desiccate. So if we look on here, there's a few numbers we see. The EK being the brand and it has 05. That means that's how much desiccate area. Uh, I believe it's in cubic inches. And then the three stands for three eighths. This is a three eighths line. If we look on this one, this is a 41. So it's a 41 cubic inch desiccate area. So it's a huge filter. So this one's half and this one's a 41. So it's huge. And then the five stands for a half inch line size. So the line coming in here is half inch, 
outside diameter tubing. So this filter dryer will hold a whole lot more contaminants than this one will. So the idea is that your filter dryer can be larger but never smaller than what you need. So typically in residential, I would carry five ton filter dryers because a five ton would replace a four ton, three and a half, three, two and a half, two, one, one and a half, all those different options. And refrigeration sometimes is a little bit different because you have to take up the account of the space that filter dryer can fit in and some other aspects. But in residential, we typically I just kept five ton filter dryers and made them work in most scenarios. So not all filter dryers are gonna have this metal painted end. Some of the manufacturers, the factory ones, used filter dryers like this. And this filter dryer inside is your desket material. And it looks a little bit different, but it's still a filter dryer. However, there's a little bit of a catch. Sometimes you end up working with mufflers and a muffler may look the same as this liquid line filter dryer. So this is an example of a muffler, another example of a muffler. Both of these are mufflers, they're hollow inside. But a muffler is gonna be on the discharge line and a filter dryer should be on the liquid line. How can you tell if somebody put a filter dryer or if they put a muffler on there? Well, a cool little trick is you can get an adjustable wrench, which we all keep in our truck. So here I have my adjustable wrench and what we have is the filter dryer or the muffler. And if we tap on it, you can hear that hollow ring to it. That's how we know that it's hollow. And if I have my liquid line filter dryer, we tap on that and it's a definite thud sound because it's solid inside. Here's another example of a metal one, thud, thud. And if we tap on our muffler, you hear that definite ring to it. So it's a little different because it's open, but it has that ring to it. So that's a good way to know is if it's a muffler or filter dryer without reading the words, because the words may be gone. So the line size coming in, the direction of that filter dryer, and the capacity of that filter dryer, all very important when you get a new filter dryer. Few more things we need to know about this filter dryer is there is a solid core, and a solid core, you gotta be careful. If you drop the solid core, it could crack this material. So you don't want it to crack. Other types of filter dryers use a type of loose BB style. This material here is what fits up inside them. See this big spring? This spring pushes against this little metal plate, and that metal plate pushes against this filter material. So all of these BBs fit up in here, and it's, the spring keeps the pressure on it. So the refrigerant has to travel through all the desiccate, which dries it. So it's filtering it through the desiccate that fills here, and then it filters it again before it carries on through the line. Some people like these because if you drop them, they're not going to break. It just simply, the spring absorbs the pressure. I've had people argue over which one's the best, I have my own opinions, but I think overall it's fairly minor. Let's have a unit with a burnout. And I'm having, I know I'm gonna have to come back and change this filter, or maybe it has moisture in the system. I'm trying to save that unit. One of the things I can do is change out the filter dryer. It's gonna absorb that moisture and help pull out some of that acid. So I have my existing valve that I'm already working with. And what I'll do is I'll add another valve to the unit. Now this isn't an industry standard thing. This is just something that I've used in the past. And I put my new valve here and my existing valve and units there, and it would have a little bit more space, but it'd be something like this. The, and I would also have a service port here. The good news about that is when I come back and I have to change out this filter dryer, you may have to do this several times, is I can close this valve off, I can close this valve off, and I can recover the refrigerant from just this section. I can then take out my old filter dryer, braze in my new filter dryer. While I'm brazing my new filter dryer, I can purge nitrogen through the line at my two ports, and then braze my new filter, line, filter dryer. I can pressure test my new filter dryer, pull a vacuum on just this little section, which is really fast, and then I can open this valve and open this valve and let my refrigerant flow through again. It saves a lot of time. Now, I'm not gonna do this in every call because this valve can be expensive, but if I know that I'm gonna have to come back, for example, I have a burnout or I have a system that I'm having to clean up and I'm having to change it several times, this little valve can really be beneficial in saving me a lot of time. The cost of the valve saves me time, less time for recovery, less time for brazing, less time for pressure testing, less time for pulling a vacuum. It really can save the day. So it's a little trick of the trade uh, I like to do. Now we talked about that desiccate material. If I have a burnout, I'm probably gonna use a larger style filter dryer. I'm also gonna use a filter dryer that picks up more acid. So we talked about the different sizes. So this in the middle here, it says 05. Those first two numbers is really the desiccate size. So this one has an 05, 
where this beauty over here is a 41. So it's a 41 cubic inch. It's a huge amount of uh, filter material surface area that this is allowing it to absorb moisture, whereas this one is a very small amount. You can go bigger, you certainly can't go smaller. So if I'm having an issue with the system, a lot of moisture, I would definitely want to go larger. We talked about the desiccant material in here. So here's a Danfoss. We look on the end and this one tells us that it's a DCL 163. So 16 is going to be our cubic inch or our sizing for our desiccant material. And then the three is going to be for three eighths. And it tells us again here in three eighths flare out three eighths flare. So if we take a look at this guy, we see that we have the flared cap right here. I'm not going to open it because this is still a good dryer. We have the flared cap. We have all that same information on it. The Parker brand, it says it's number 16S. So here we see 16 and 16. Both of these filter dryers are the same. And then three for 3 8 connection, three for 3 8 connection. So they're both the same. This one though is a flare connection, flare, and this one is solder or sweat or brace. So difference in it. But let's look at how they do their lines. Here we see it's a 136S, so 163S and it says it's 3 8 solder, and this is good for air conditioning, three tons of air conditioning, R22, 407C, or 410A. So it's good for four, for three ton units. So if I had a five ton unit, I would need to get a different size filter dryer. So it would be up to three ton, anything less than up to three ton, but not greater than. So little graphs on all these. Now notice these also say to protect the unit when you're brazing, and also to run into nitrogen through the system while you're brazing. Make sure we don't have any oxidation. Every manufacturer is a little different for as far as what they request, but if you understand what the sizing is, you understand what these numbers mean, it helps you work on it. When I was a carrier dealer, I'd only carry carrier parts, so I carried the OEM carrier filter dryer, so I wanted to be the best, and I didn't realize it was just simply costing me extra money. So here is the carrier factory filter dryer, and when I got to looking on here and started learning about more stuff, it did say with Puron, registered trademark, 410A refrigerant, uh, 680 PSI, must be installed per unit installation instructions, which it never come with. Uh, but what the difference is, it would fit in the exact same location. But as far as the size, it's a 30 uh, on the capacity, at 3 for the 3 8 connection, and S for the solder sweat or braze connection, and it told us the direction of her flow. So the only difference is they charge a lot more, and you had the exact size from the factory fitting. But as long as you knew I needed to have at least 30 or bigger, 3 for 3 eighths and S for sweat, solder, braze, I could put something in the same size or bigger. So knowing the size helps and you can get the same brand, whatever you need to work with. Now to work with heat pumps, you're going to end up with another option. You know what we call bi-flow filter dryers. We're going to talk about these more with heat pumps, but the refrigerant can flow either direction. I know some people that keep only bi-flow five ton filter dryers in their service van, the cost difference between a five ton filter dryer bi-flow and a five ton filter dryer that's just one way is significant. The bi-flow filter dryer has these extra valves built into it on both sides. So when the refrigerant is flowing this direction, it goes through the outside filter dryer into the center and out the other side and the refrigerant flows the other direction the valves change and it's going through these valves. They open to the outside, through the center and through the inside. So either way, it's filtering from the outside in. So it keeps all the contaminants on one side. They do cost more for the five ton filter dryers. All right, let's talk quickly about commercial filter dryers. Uh, we got the commercial filter dryers. Desiccate looks like this. And that desiccate material is important. If you drop this, this cracks, you're gonna have issues. Uh, there was a picture the other day somebody had on Facebook where this had turned actually to sand, which I can't imagine other than vibration, what would cause it, but that's a bad day. So this one's been cut so people can see it, but they still filter from the outside to the inside. And when you order those, they come in these really cool cans. And these cans are sealed, so it's not absorbing any moisture. Well, as soon as you pop this top, this desk material starts absorbing moisture. Same thing with these filter dryers. That, as soon as you pull these ends off, they're pulling out moisture. So to make sure when you're ready to work for it, you pull that cap at the very last. You want to do it as quick as possible because this is absorbing moisture from the air. Same as this. As soon as you open this can, it's absorbing moisture from the air. So you want to have this on as quick as possible and flow nitrogen through so you're absorbing, using that capacity to absorb moisture from the refrigerant. 
So these, this can, once you pop this top off, it starts immediately absorbing moisture. What's cool about those is they have valves and they're bolted together and you change out these filter dryers. And this one's standard capacity. What's cool is this one's for water and acid removal for liquid and the suction side. But when you look at some of the other options we have, this one is a high moisture capacity, uh, water and acid removal for 48 cubic inch, which is massive. Cubic inch desiccant block for use with CFCs, HCFCs, HFCs, mineral and peel oil. So this is good for just about everything we're gonna work with. And the same thing, it has directions, but you wanna only put that in when you're absolutely ready to go. So you know you're not absorbing moisture from the air. So that's pretty much the gist of our liquid line filter dryers. Uh, let's just quick review. You have the center two numbers is your desiccate size. The last number is gonna be the size of the piping. And if you have a letter, it's gonna be either for sweat or uh, F for flare. And you wanna make sure your filter is ideally inside. Uh, but if you do have it outside, you wanna make sure that it's protected. It's not gonna rust on you. And you wanna make sure it's the correct direction flowing away from the condenser towards the metering device. You always wanna make sure there's only one filter dryer. Sometimes there's another one behind the valve, only one in the system. And anytime you open the system, change the filter dryer. You wanna make sure you leave the caps on until you're ready to use it and never blow through these filter dryers. I've seen uh, students before, and even young techs, they'll pull this off and they'll try to blow through it. I don't understand why, but the moisture from your breath will contaminate and completely ruin this filter dryer. They look at all different sizes, all different brands, and all different styles. Uh, you're gonna definitely have something you're gonna be working with a lot is the filter dryers. And if you're gonna deal with a flared connection, make sure you understand about flaring and the proper way for flaring. Let's take a look real quick at what it looks like when a filter dryer is behind the valve. Here's an example of a filter dryer behind the valve. And let's take a look at the flow of refrigerant. Refrigerant's leaving my condensing unit into the filter dryer, out of the filter dryer, into my valve, out of the valve, through my liquid line to the house. So my valve is here. So if I have to do a pump down, which we'll get to soon, if I have to do a pump down and I close this valve, I have my filter dryer behind the valve. So it's gonna be very difficult to change it. I have to actually take all of the refrigerant out of the system to change this filter dryer, which is quite time consuming. So anytime I have the filter dryer behind the valve, I like to put in a straight piece of pipe here. In other words, take this out, put a straight piece of pipe. So when I put that straight piece of pipe in, I can put my new filter dryer ideally before the metering device, but at least outside of this valve so the next guy, which is probably gonna be me, can get to it a whole lot easier. So then the question is, why do manufacturers put it inside the system? And the reason is they used to require you to put a filter dryer in, but they found out through warranty compressors that people weren't doing that. So they started including a filter dryer with the new system. So Carrier, for example, would send a new filter dryer with the new unit. But technicians would take the filter dryer, throw it in a truck, like, sweet, I got a new filter dryer. And they wouldn't put a filter dryer in the system. Well, the moisture would turn into acid and you end up having compressor warranty issues. So the manufacturers had to do something to control that. So they started putting filter dryers with the system. Now, if they put the filter dryer out here, the problem would be the box would have to be bigger. The pallets would have to be bigger. You could get less systems on a truck and you could get less systems in a warehouse. So they had to put it the only place they could behind the valve. So in this particular unit, that's still pretty easy to get to. But a lot of units, the, right behind the valve, right here, you will have your condensing coil. And this will be behind the condensing coil under the fan in the very hard to get to location. So it's very difficult to get to. I've seen it before where people have left that filter dryer and they add a new filter dryer out here. Well, that one gets clogged up. It never shows up on your pressures because there's no pressure gauge here. And it ends up burning out the compressor. We had a unit donated to the school that kept eating compressors. They finally replaced it. They had a new filter dryer outside. Inside, they had the original filter dryer, and that thing was completely clogged up when we cut it out. And since it was clogged up, it's causing a massive head pressure that ended up burning out the compressors. So the location of that filter dryer and making sure you only have one is so extremely important.